I'll be sharing my slide first and let's go from there because we are running out of time as well. Oops, sorry. All right. So the title that I'm going to share is quite obvious that I'll be talking more on language education. Dr. Tazli will be demonstrating more on the uh, hands-on part. So I will not giving you live demo. Uh, I give the honor to Dr. Tazli to do it. And then Prof. Nara, of course, will sum up everything for the way forward and also the implication of, um, you know, the current development that we're having. Now, I intentionally put when imitation becomes inspiration for a reason. And later on, you understand why I, I word it that way. So this is the elephant in the room. Yeah. Uh, everyone is talking about this elephant. And uh, <laughs> whether you like it or not, whether you hate elephant or not, you have to address the elephant in the room. And uh, GPT, as mentioned by Dr. Annie just now, stands for- Tiger looking at you. Sorry, I hear some, okay. So GPT is a generative pre-trained transformer. Um, for those who are not aware, the correct link to this one is chat.openai.com. I know some have downloaded the wrong version. ChatGPT has no app version. Don't download from Play Store. Don't download from App Store. Those are people taking advantage of the GPT engine. So I, I know some actually paid for it, which is unfortunately not the right one. So you should go to the link chat.openai.com. This is the correct version of the GPT engine. Uh, I know some downloaded the wrong one and they start complaining how, how stupid it is. Of course, because that's the wrong one, not the, not the correct ChatGPT. People are taking advantage of the name. All right. But before ChatGPT become viral, I think we know this, it, it evolved from GPT engine itself, Transformer, which originally from Transformer architecture developed by Google at first. But because they were so so slow in the in the pace and OpenAI community took up the, the, the architecture, the Transformer, which is the beauty of the GPT engine, it can actually transform from a large language model and try to form different types of languages and sentences that you feel so unique it's very rare for you to get the same response, you know, at one, even if you ask the same question, it's very rare for you to get, to get the same answer because of the uh, transformer part. Anyhow, you have Quillboard, Grammarly, Jasper, Copia, and so many out there which has been, uh, which have been using GPT engine for quite some time. But of course, the big one is of course ChatGPT due to its openness and all that. Uh, my own research and also, you know, uh, other res related researchers has shown that even before ChatGPT became viral, the use of chatbots in teaching and learning has been around for, for so many years. In fact, teachers in Malaysia, they are aware of a lot of tools and they have been using it. It's nothing new to them. It's just that ChatGPT make it like a hype thing because of its capability. So I think in terms of familiar, uh, familiarization of using it for teaching and learning is there. It's just that we have to be aware of its capability, right? Which is the purpose of the, today's uh, forum and today's discussion. I would love to start with this one by George Bernard Shaw. Imitation is not just the sincerest form of flattery, it's the sincerest form of learning. I reflect um, uh, I reflected this a lot, even if you take a look at science of learning, take a look at all the learning theories, take a look at all the instructional design principle, there are nuances of imitation all over. Even when you're learning language, people are telling you fake it till you make it, right? If, if you're teaching languages, you will tell your student, just copy this guy, whatever this guy is doing, and just repeat it until you become so good at it. Even in anything, even when you're learning programming, whether you're learning some chemical, you're you are going to you know, you're going to face that kind of imitation uh, strategy where you learn from following other people first, you get inspiration, then you innovate, and then you create. I'm not saying that copying is good. I'm not saying that you should point blank, you know, uh, promote plagiarism. No, any form of learning will begin with imitation. Even, you know, from our young age, we learn from our parents, we, we, we take a look, we observe our parents, and then from our teachers, from our lecturers, from our peers, we learn through imitation a lot. But what if all these role models are gone, right? Imagine in, at home where your parents are so busy making ends meet, they have no time to even teach you. Imagine when you want to ask your friends, your friends are not also equally ignorant or maybe not into the, the level that you expect them to be. Imagine when lecturers are so busy with other research work, they don't have time to even give you feedback. What would happen to this kind of learning? You need somebody to replace it. And just so happen now, we have tools like AI, uh, AI tools like ChatGPT that fulfill this gap, to be honest. AI is doing a noble job, <laughs> to, to be honest, in a way, to, to replace the role model that we are craving, to imitate, to learn, and to copy from, 
from uh, from a source of inspiration. But again, I'm not saying that you should allow it to happen uh, freely. There are some limitation to it, but these are the things that we need to be aware of. So I'm going to start with the first one, opportunities in language education. I want to focus on language education or any other courses or any other programs that seems to rely a lot on language output. If your courses are still relying on language output, like you ask students to write essays in final exam, you write essays in reports or whatever, then you probably need to be aware of the capability of ChatGPT and also the limitation. Right? I'm going to start with the opportunity first. Not many, because not, 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 not much time available. <laughs> first one, contextualized language learning. This is the beauty of ChatGPT. As mentioned by Dr. Annie just now, it keeps the conversation flowing as if you're talking to a human-like robot, which seems somehow seems to understand the whole context when you start it, you know, start it with some, something, you start to understand it. Now, imagine you are attending a mock interview. You have no idea what kind of question that you will get from the interviewer. You can actually ask ChatGPT to act as an interviewer. In this case, I've put example here, act as an interviewer for mock interview to, uh, to be held. Actually, it's a grammatical error here. We have a media agency known as Media Prima. I would like you to practice the mock interview with me by asking me relevant questions and responding to my answers. You give a clear prompt to ChatGPT that you want to use this as a learning, uh, you know, as a learning process. And ChatGPT happily say, sure, I'll be happy to help you with your mock interview for Media Prima to start. Can you tell me a bit about yourself and your background? Then you start to answer, you give your answer, and then you will give it back. Imagine if you were to do this with your lecturers. I don't think your lecturers will have time to entertain one by one, right? Or I, I don't think even when you ask your, your brother or your sister to do this, I don't think they can sometimes. So you might, might as well learn it on your own. You see the responses? Great, it's good to know. Can you tell me more interest? And this uh, beauty of, uh, you know, the chat GPT is it generates more relevant question to let you think, actually. It's not like point blank asking you to just copy and paste. It also helps you to think. Now, I don't understand that question. Can you rephrase? Then, sure, let me rephrase. What do you find attractive about Media Prima as a potential employer? So, so. I mean, imagine this go on and on. I, I can spend like hours just learning about all the sentences and I start to pick up and then I transfer it to maybe text to speech engine. I learn how to pronounce the word and then I can improve my interview session. Probably I'll, I'll be more confident to attend the interview, right? That's the beauty, the first beauty or the first opportunity of uh, ChatGPT. Next one will be seamless multilingual interaction. I think we know because the GPT engine uses a large language model which encompass a lot of uh, languages. For languages uh, other than um, other than English at the moment, there are some limitation here and there, but they are expanding as we use. Uh, like for example, dalam bahasa Melayu, masalahnya ialah selalu dicelarukan dengan bahasa Indonesia. Sebab corpus, size corpus bahasa Indonesia jauh lebih besar daripada bahasa Melayu. So you can see some nuances of bahasa Indonesia even when you're asking it in bahasa Melayu. So this example, saya tidak faham maksud seamless. Boleh tolong terangkan dalam satu ayat. This is in Malay. And I can switch code switch immediately in another language without giving another context. I can just keep the conversation flowing. How to use in a sentence. And then dia kata, contoh penggunaan. Seamless dalam ayat, nampak tak di terjemahan diberikan terus. So this ChatGPT is telling you that, okay, you want to learn this one, can. This is also the meaning in Malay. Imagine if you want to learn language, you can actually learn a lot through this process. Then I, I switch to uh, Chinese, you can see. And of course, the, 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 I just keep the conversation flowing. And it replies me in Chinese, which is quite correct here, and it, with a good example. And then I purposely twist it to Arabic. Of course, some minor, minor, minor problem in the reply, but you can see everything is in a flow with multilingual support with no problem at all in switching. If, uh, if, you, uh, if you were to use other forms of chatbot, they would say, I don't understand. But in ChatGPT, this thing happens very fast. And if you are learning languages, this is one way to get your corpus running and to learn more and more and more, right? So this is the, the advantage. Of course, you can try other languages. Lah. I just demo some languages here. Later on, Dr. Tazi will show you the real time, how fast it is, right? Third one is adaptive language learning. And now, why do I call it adaptive? Because if you were to learn in the class, uh, it's very hard for lecturers to do 
uh, differentiated learning, especially when the class size is too big. Imagine if you have 200, 300 students, I don't think you have the time to actually say, okay, these are the, for the not so good one, this one is for the average group, this one is for the good one. I don't think you have time to even prepare different sets of materials, right? You can use ChatGPT to generate different types of content, different types of uh, learning material to suit different types of learners, or to allow students to use it and adapt to their own level. For example, I don't understand the meaning of missing the boat in this article. So let's say you give this article to your student in the class, right? Normally they will, of course, ask you or WhatsApp you in the middle of the night and say, okay, I don't, uh, sir, what is missing the boat here? Is it missing the, the sampan or whatever? So normally they would do that. But with ChatGPT, if they are empowered to know how to ask the right questions, then they can just give the link to the article and then ChatGPT happily answer in this article, missing the boat is used as an idiomatic expression to mean that blah, 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 blah. Let's say you don't understand this, right? Imagine that you don't understand this still. You can say, aduh, panjang sangat. Boleh terangkan secara ringkas dalam dua ayat ke? You see, I use broken language in a way or a very casual conversational manner. The chat GBT is still happily answering my question. Missing the boat dalam artikel tersebut bermaksud membuat kesilapan dengan tidak mengambil kesempatan yang baik. I think this is a good learning mechanism for self-regulated learning and how it adapts to your level. Imagine kalau you buat dalam class, I don't think student will be willingly to ask this question because takut kena marah, kan? Takut kena cop bodoh lah apa. So with ChatGPT, you remove all this barrier. And if you, if it's used correctly, right? If you, if you educate your um, your students on how to empower themselves through this whole learning process. For teachers, for educators, for lecturers, later on, Dr. Tazi will, will show you more on this. You can actually develop a lot of learning material as well from ChatGPT. It just, it's not just for Q&A. &Q there are a lot of functions in ChatGPT that you can also um, you know, make use of. For example, this one. You can generate a text and comprehension question. Can you provide a 150-word passage about deforestation followed by two questions? I didn't ask for answer. You can even ask for answer and justify the answer. And they will, it will actually provide the answer all with the justification. Of course, again, ChatGPT is just an assistive tool, not meant to replace you. You still have to read as a, you know, and, and do the filtering, do the checking, uh, fact check and all that before you allow this to be used, right? You can also create dialogue. I think this is a challenge for language teaching as well. Uh, to come up with a dialogue is not easy, right? It's really, really not easy. And uh, you can create a dialogue and you can use this in class, right? For example, I asked ChatGPT to generate this. We bring it to class and then we can practice together on how to, how to communicate well with all, this, uh, uh, all the language uh, uh, aspect and all that. In fact, this can be done for anything. It doesn't have to be limited to language. You can even role play with like an like a expert in biotech or whatever, and then do a conversation like you're interviewing a, a real expert. But of course, still need to check, right? So those are the four. I I, I narrow down to four because of the time uh, constraint. But there are many more, of course, uh, in 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 the capability of ChatGPT, which uh, Dr. Tazli will show you later. Now is the threat. I think this is the the hot topic where. People tend to ignore all the good things. They will focus more on the bad things because the bad things are always the, the key concern, right? And uh, it tends to overshadow the benefit. Now, there are quite a number of threats, but I, I covered the three main ones for language learning or language education. The issue with deep reading. This has been happening even before ChatGPT. A lot of students these days, they don't really read deeply due to the micro learning concept and even all this... Uh, uh, social media, uh, micro content, right? You have TikTok and all that. Everyone seems to have short attention span. I don't know who get this, but somehow we assume that generation these days have very short attention span. They don't read deeply. It has been happening before ChatGPT. Now with ChatGPT, it's going to be worse <laughs> because you can feed it with a... I, I actually cut it off. It's a long text, or even you can give a link. You don't even have to ask any question. You just type TLDR. TLDR stands for too long, didn't read. It will automatically summarize the thing for you. And I have been doing this a few times and I, will, I was checking on the accuracy. The accuracy is quite high. The summary is actually pretty good compared to the, I mean, it's not as lousy as just picking up some sentences from the tag. It's quite accurate, right? So you can imagine if this happens 
since young, <laughs> imagine this was used in uh, starting from primary one onwards, you'll be surprised that students these days may not be able to read deeply. They will just scheme and scan and get the G's and, and that's it, right? So I also asked this one, do you know the book Norwegian Wood by Haruki Murakami? So I asked, and somehow it seems to know, right? And it, yes, I'm familiar with the book, blah, blah. I, of course, get it from the internet resources. And I also asked, can you summarize it in 50 words? So I don't even have to read the novel. I can somehow know about the novel without reading it. <laughs> I mean, imagine if this is used by, uh, by students, right? And also the rise of artificial creativity. I shared this in a talk with the Dewan Bahasa dan Pustaka. I generated a perfect saja in less than five seconds. And this one is a poem about Sarawak. And if you read it, it's quite okay. It's quite relevant. From laksa to kek lapis, a treat, a culinary journey that can't be beat. Of course, the error there is beaten, right? But then because of the artificial rhyme. But it's quite okay in a way of understanding the context. And this is the problem when people are using ChatGPT to generate artificial creative work and start to sell it. Uh, this is the part that we will be uh, worrying about. And it's also high time for all these existing copyright laws to also look into, look into this. Because at the moment, you can't sue anyone because there's nobody. <laughs> I mean, like, copyright law says it has to belong to a person, right? This one doesn't belong to anyone. So you need to probably revise... I mean, people uh, handling the, uh, the copyright law probably need to ha uh, handle this part, right? This is the Malay version I told you, right? Tulis sajak ringkas tentang pentingnya bahasa Melayu sebagai bahasa kebangsaan. It's genuine. Bahasa Melayu, bahasa kebangsaan, menyatukan rakyat Malaysia, pemersatu bangsa dan perpaduan, blah, 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 blah. You can see it's quite okay for a language, even though with some uh, nuances of bahasa Indonesia from time to time. But you can imagine what will happen in the next version. The next version is coming up. Uh, chat GT, uh, GPT-4 is coming up soon. You'll be surprised with the number of tokens that it can handle too. Last one, the threat is the lost skill of writing. I think <laughs> this is the this is the tough part to address. Even before even before Chat GPT, I've been I've been arguing this. I don't think we need to write anymore. <laughs> we are just generating stuff now. Even before Chat GPT, right? Ask ourselves. Sometimes we just. We just copy somewhere and then we go and paraphrase it and then somehow we get some ideas and then we start to rewrite. The, the actual act of holding a pen and writing an essay only occurs during examination <laughs> somehow. And, uh, and, and uh, I think now if you, if you ask anyone here to hold a pen and write a full essay in, in one hour, you will be like uh, stressed out because somehow you have a mental block, right? So ChatGPT will, will, will kind of intensify this because it becomes more like a prompt engineering. Prompt engineering means you just have to play with the prompt. You need to learn how to engineer the prompt so that it can generate whatever you want. For example, here, can you write a research problem in about two paragraphs to highlight the gap in research concerning the lack of engagement among students during online learning? And the research problem is going to be written to you into a paragraph. Of course, you still have to check. You may, not have, you may not want to copy blindly, but it gives you an idea how to write a research problem. And then you probably learn, and oh, okay, this is how you write it. I just have to find the relevant citation or references to back up all my claims here. You get what I mean? That's the changing part of teaching writing <laughs> and the scarier part too, right? Because you are no longer teaching them the real art of writing. You are more like the real, uh, the, 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 the skill of verifying information, the skill of justifying your points more than the uh, sentence construction and all that. Same thing here. You can even be more specific. You can say, write an essay about pro and cons of artificial intelligence in, in education by using the following points. Point pro one, pro two, con one, con two. And you'll be surprised it actually follows like this one. Automation or routine tasks, automation or routine tasks, augment learning activity, which is the same one. And then it will go on and on exactly to what you told it to do. And it will even give you example and the uh, elaboration. Scary, right? <laughs> All right. So we go, I'm going to end it with this part. The issue of academic dishonesty. Just to wrap up whatever I have I've, uh, mentioned to you about the opportunity and threats. And I think this is the one that probably will concern a lot of management uh, issue. So we have been hearing about this, academic dishonesty, right? Even before ChatGPT, like I said, uh, plagiarism has been around for so many years, even, you know, as old as examination, people have been cheating here and there, doing all sorts of ways to cheat. Then you have a lot of articles saying that, like this one, are students cheating or they are just staying ahead of time? 
maybe there's no longer relevant to sit for exam. Why, right? I mean, what's what's wrong with generating text through uh, ChatGPT, for example? Or maybe um, maybe here's why in education um, thing it should you know uh, be embraced rather than be shun. You know, there are a lot of arguments whether you should embrace or shun. And also this one from OpenAI CTO in, uh, herself, she mentioned must be regulated. And AI can be used by bad actors. Even the open AI or ChatGPT uh, uh, founder felt that it should be uh, regulated. But of course, you have to read further. The regulation is not what we, what we understood, right? Next one, it will be it's time to rethink teaching and testing. A couple of years ago, we've been talking about this, right? Remember the pandemic? Everyone is talking about, oh, you need to redesign your assessment. We cannot do the same old stuff. And again, but after the pandemic, somehow we reset. We back to the old way of assessing students force them to sit in exam, answering MCQ, uh, write pages and pages of essay, uh, regurgitating all the facts out, and uh, hoping that by then we will be able to measure the competency. So AI now is asking us to re rethink again of the same old issue of whether or not our assessment is really aligned for learning or, and, and for empowerment or just for the sake of certification, right? So I would like to offer four ideas here <laughs> before I stop. First one, of course, same old, same old cliche. Real design assessment, assess what matters most, right? Like in my case, uh, when you're teaching academic English, who on earth actually sit together three, with three heads, write a three page essay on a general, generic topic? You, you don't have to do that in your real life, right? Like three people to write a three page essay. Sounds so weird. <laughs> I mean, if you were to look at it from the authenticity part, you'll be wondering, why am I doing this? I, when I go out to work, my boss never asked me to write a three-page essay with another friend or with another partner, right? There will be a lot of issue with that. I mean, I'm not saying that it's wrong. What I mean here is maybe you are measuring the wrong thing. And also, when it comes to language output, it's always the, 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 uh, the measurement of the competency based on the linguistic output or the language output alone, which is weird, right? You're teaching an engineer to, let's say, to build bridges, but you're judging them on the final report alone. It sounds so weird. So just because I can build a bridge, but I don't have, I don't have the skill to write the report, I'm going to fail the course. You, you, I mean, I'm not saying that you're doing it now. I'm saying that this is the dilemma that we're facing. You're using the language output as the sole measurement of one's competency, which may not be uh, correct, right? Number two, focus on teacher-student communication. Actually, if you know your student, if your class is small, huh? this is if your class is small, whatever AI generated tool that they use, it will be so salient to your eyes. Like in my case, if I teach my student, the moment I talk to this guy, he can barely answer me in a proper sentence. Suddenly he submitted a perfect essay. Something is not right. All this, all this um, behavior, or all this output will be salient to your eyes if you know your student. I'm saying this because the class is small. But what if your class is bigger? Then you have to use a different mechanism of helping them. Uh, to uh, make, not to say helping them to to uh, to kind of uh, buffer this issue, which is number three, provide a clear provision on the use of AI. As much as I'm pro technology, I still think it should be regulated, but to educate, not to punish. What do I mean? Regulate to educate the same way we deal with TikTok, the same way we deal with any social media, the same way we deal with drugs, the same way we deal with. Um, uh, you know, uh, secrets and all that. It's there for a reason, but we have to regulate in terms of what happened if they use it wrongly. Instead of punishing them, are you going to provide a safety net? Are you going to tell them that, okay, look, I know that you're, you, you are not honest in this part. You're using uh, ChatGPT to generate the answers. Can you now pitch to me in front of me in five minutes, whatever you have written? If you can't, then I'm going to assess you again next week. You get what I mean? There's a safety net so that the student know that what they did is wrong. You are educating them. You are not just punishing them. Ah, this guy just cheated. I'm going to fail him. That's not the purpose of education to begin with, right? And of course, you also have to educate students on academic uh, integrity and ethics. I talk about this a lot because I noticed even when my time, when we entered university, we were only brief about regulation. But nobody told us that copying directly from website, right, and just putting the citation is wrong. <laughs> you still have to paraphrase. Nobody told me that. I have to learn on my own. Where, oh, lecturer say, yeah, this is, this, I, I give you zero because you copy, even though you put citation there. Then I realize, oh, okay, now I know I have to paraphrase. 
these are the things that we don't really pay attention to because we are so focusing on punishing rather than providing the, uh, you know, regulate to uh, educate. I think that's all from me. If you like the slide, you can just download it from that link. And I'm going to pass it to uh, uh, Dr. Annie.